the steer stone, uh -huh. but at least hadn't seen that picture. Oh, okay. Right, which was great because that was kind of our 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 target audience of a bit was people that didn't know a bit about it. I think that's fair to say. I mean, yeah. not that we're playing experts. Yeah. But I think part of our assumption is that. Uh, I mean, the reason we put Berkeley in the subtitle is the idea that somehow different things get talked about here than get talked about other places. Yeah. And to explore whether or not that's true, and if so, how it matters. Exactly. Other feedback I got was surprised that I didn't actually know about some of these things. And I was thinking about that. And um, I tried to think back. You know, I asked in the in the first episode when you first saw the picture. And, the, um, and then I thought about me. The first time I saw it was when I saw that South Park episode. Oh yeah. What what year was that? Do you know? It's, it's been about five to six years. Okay. For me. So anyway. slightly before the photo was released. Yeah. Okay. That, and it was so weird that I was like, okay, you know what? These guys got to be making all this up. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was fun. Um, that uh, yeah, I really just didn't know a lot about this stuff, and that's okay, because that's not really my job as a member of the church is to know these things. True, but let me ask you a question. Yeah. Because I, I think it is fair to say that it is not unusual that people who become disenchanted with the church, it's it's not infrequently... i sorry, sorry for all these double negatives. I don't mm -hmm. know why I'm talking this way. Uh, but it's not infrequently true that it's something like discovering something from a South Park episode instead yeah. of Sunday school, yeah. feeling like there's some dishonesty or subterfuge going on yeah. and falling away. Well, why it's not really not the case. No, yeah. I, I agree it's not, yeah. but I'm, I'm just curious. Like, yeah. Well, this was the third piece this of feedback. This was recent enough, maybe you remember good. your... Okay, go on. The third piece of feedback that I got, which was great, was that lately, within the last several years, the church has been really trying to make this kind of... to talk about this stuff. And yes. so, specifically, the the book Saints, which I understand you're using in seminary. Or maybe starting well, to use? I... It was my idea to use it. Uh -huh. And the other teacher uses it on his days. And I don't know exactly how he's using it, so I'm just letting him use it. Uh -huh. So it's <laughs> awesome. So I started listening to it. And sure enough, all the stuff that we talked about is right there in the first few chapters. So um, the, I think that's really cool. And I think that just means that um, some of the early church history is going to be known to kids which is great yeah so anyway those were the pieces of feedback i got i got people who didn't know anything and were excited by it i got people who who did know stuff and thought i should have <laughs> <laughs> and i got people saying go listen to saints which was and all, i thought this was all really really good feedback yeah um, about, nobody telling us to like nobody telling us to bridge stop just yet. go away already <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so those people haven't found us yet. <laughs> so with that, I want to jump into episode two. All right, all right. So here we go. If you're listening in the background, that is our. Um, you know how on uh, like uh, crazy radio shows on rock stations, every, every once in a while there's a third character who's sitting in the booth and makes noise, <laughs> sound effects, and so forth. That role tonight is played by my daughter, who is turning two in a couple weeks. Oh, well, that's exciting. She can tell that something weird is. A all right, the audio quality might have changed a bit. We're now actually in my car. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to know why. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, but Eric. also, I don't. Oh, yeah, go ahead. If people are listening to this in stereo, we've just switched sides. Oh, yeah, that's right. That might totally yeah. screw them up. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, okay, Eric, so here we are. Let's start here with the comic strip that I wanted to talk about here. Um, the topic of the comic strip is theodicy. Is that how you say it? I believe so. Okay, theodicy. Um, I first saw this comic strip. So it's by Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial, uh, SMBC. Um, I believe it was Mike Urbancic who first put it on Twitter, and that's what called it to oh, my attention. Oh, okay. This was like five years ago, maybe even six years. Mm, it's got to be about five years ago. And i got to say, I, it really hit me like a ton of bricks. Okay, I I had that sounds like a bad thing. It was well, okay. I, it was like one of these things where I had to really wrap my head around it and figure out how I f I felt about it because I hadn't really ever gone down this logical road. We're gonna come come back to that in a second. Okay, so here's here we go. God is like a table held on three legs. All right, so very what, good. So panel go ahead. one. Panel one. The, the, the three legs are labeled omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. That's right. All right. I'll, on top of the table is a ball called Theodicy. Theodicy. All right. Describe it's nice the ball. and red. It's a beautiful red ball. Beautiful red ball. I I don't think it's like a clown nose. I think it's probably more like a rubber ball. A but rubber ball. it's yep. a pretty simple drawing. It's hard to be sure. All right. The ball is out of reach. But, but we, we want, want it. Want it. <laughs> and there's this wonderful big blue man trying yes. to reach the ball. He's stretching so high. Yeah, trying to reach the ball up on the th on the table. 
All right, we can only get the ball by shortening any one of the legs. So if we take the omni off of seant, we have free will, mm -hmm. meaning I suppose that God can't guess what we're going to do. Yeah. If we take the omni off of potent, we have God has bigger concerns than you, which I guess means God can't bo be bothered with everything. He can't do everything, so screw you. Mm -hmm. And if we if we take the omni off of benevolent, we get God works in mysterious dickish ways, <laughs> which is a very um, SMBC phrase. It is very good. It's very SMBC. SMBC is a very skeptical comic. Yes, That's and cynical as well. And very cynical, yeah. yeah. But um, funny. It I mean, is very funny. It's good, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So each of these releases the ball, but it makes the table ugly. So if you make any kind of compromise in those three things, that God loves us, that God, God can do anything, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And that God knows everything. If you compromise even a little bit, that shortens one of the legs and you get the ball. Theodicy. All right? Which we'll come back to in a second. That What does the ball represent? Oh, well, maybe we should do that now. So what is theodicy in this case? Theodicy, as I understand, is the problem with evil, right? If, if those three things are true about God, he loves us, he can do anything, and he knows everything, then why is there evil in the world? Because God knows about it, he doesn't want it to happen, and he can stop it. Ergo, it sh there should be no evil, there should be no pain, there should be no suffering. Right. So for most people, this is disturbing, that you have to compromise God in some way. The blue man has very sad eyebrows. He's very sad. Yeah. All right. Just kidding. Most people don't care. <laughs> so he runs away with, with the red ball, and he's happy. Um, all he cares about is that he believes um, that that there is there is a God, and that he can um, be um, consistent, in all, even though he, according to this argument, he can't be. And then it says, and in all fairness, it's probably better than the alternative. So, what does skepticism offer? The blue man asks. And, and, and the guy with glasses <laughs> says, a wonderful, beautiful, doesn't give a beep about you, Cosmos. <laughs> exactly. Censorship added for our more sensitive viewers. Exactly. All right. So the argument is that you have to compromise God in order for things to be logically consistent. Now, so before, I, I know that you have some material. And before we go deep onto this, because I think it's really interesting, um, this whole topic I want to tell you why this hit me. Like, okay, like a let's ton, hear it. Like a ton of bricks. All right. Now, look, it's going to sound like we're going to go on a complete tangent here, but we're not. But we're going to come back. Okay. All right. <laughs> I want to. I'm an English teacher. Tangents are my, you know, that's what I work in. Your middle name. That is my. That is my area of expertise. Themathpage.com. All right. Okay. Here we go. First principles. Euclid. This is Euclid geometry. I actually love geometry okay okay just as a science um like you Euc euclidean geometry specifically or things that break euclid as well no specifically euclidean geometry although i do appreciate non-euclidean geometry as well um i learned it in high school and it's always really kind of stuck with me and this web page the mathpage.com dot com here mathpage.com it has an introduction on a section called First Principles, and this is what it says. It says, It is not possible to prove every statement. Nevertheless, we should prove as many statements as possible. All right? Okay. And I have this has kind of been one of my guiding um, principles, even though I didn't really know it. Right? I mean... To minimize uh, <laughs> assumptions. To minimize assumptions. That's a great way to put it. Right? To think critically about the world around me. And here I'm using the scientific word critic. Right? Okay. Because I'm a scientist. I believe you are. And when scientists use the word critical, they mean something very specific, which is looking for the integrity of an argument. All right? Okay. So... Integrity I, meaning, in this case, that, that all the correct, pieces... That all the pieces fit together, okay. that there are as few assumptions as possible, and that... Um, that everything fits together, that, that it is a does, sound and logical would it be, reason. Would it be fair to say that 
Occam's razor comes into play here. If there's a simpler explanation, then your explanation has less integrity. Well, not necessarily when it comes to talk topics about religion, because we're starting at a point where <laughs> religion's already we cannot prove every statement. scientific. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're starting at a point yeah. where um, we do believe that there is a God, and that we do believe that He's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipotent. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> omnipotent. So. Um, we, we we recognize that we can't prove the all of these statements, but we try to up, I try to apply a rational thinking to it. Okay, so that's kind of my long winded introduction as okay. to why this comic really kind of hit me because I didn't know how to resolve it. His argument seemed sound, right? Sure. If God is all knowing, right, then he knows that evil happens, that bad stuff happens, right? Yes. If God is all powerful then he could stop it and if god really loved us then he would right that that's is the argument sound pass okay <laughs> well there's some problematic assumptions here i think okay and um i'm going to take a tangent also this is not something i brought or planned to bring but in um in the book of alma when uh alma is speaking to um Who's the Antichrist he speaks to? Well, he's probably speaks um, to either Korhor or Amilisi. I think it's... I, I, I want to say it's Korhor. Is Korhor the one where he says, um, God is... Uh, like, I have all the universe that proves that there's a God. Is that when he's talking to Korhor? It I might be. It might also be Amilisi. We're just reading this right now. Yeah, home, so uh, I, should I, should, know I should know this too. Like, I'm embarrassed. Because <laughs> you taught this last year in seminary. <laughs> that and um, on my mission, like, I could... You could name any chapter in the Book of Mormon, I could tell you what happened in that chapter. Oh, that's really cool. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> but, um, but anyways, uh, I know someone who like was had a lot of the same concerns about faith that that this particular Antichrist came. It's not a nice thing to call someone really an Antichrist. No, it's not. Definitely, great... the editor of the Book of Mormon is trying to bias us against this person, uh -huh. um, and had a lot of those same concerns. And so, when she saw those concerns represented in the scripture, she was really excited to see what Alma's response would be because mm -hmm. it would resolve her concerns. And Alma's explanation is that um, the whole universe proves there's a God. Done. QED. Yeah, right. We're done. Like, that's it. <laughs> I remember reading that, se that uh -huh. section and also being a bit unsatisfied. Yeah, and um, <laughs> and I think, and I'm not like I think I actually like Alma, but um, I, I actually thought it was a good way to bring someone new into the. I mean, if you're not, mm -hmm. it doesn't really hold. You know, it doesn't pass this. It's, it's not very this race, rigorous. This, it's, not, it's not so rigorous, but, you know, it's not, it's not too bad, I suppose. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a technique I find annoying when people of other faiths use it. So mm -hmm. maybe I shouldn't allow Alma to do it. But, mm -hmm. um, but, I, but it comes back to our whole theodicy problem because I think the problem with the God is omniscient, God is omnipotent, God is omnibenevolent. I think the problem with saying all those three things is that that's a really simplified view of God. And it doesn't require any grappling with what God is mm, okay. because it's, it's so simple. God can do anything. God knows everything. God is perfectly good. And I'm not saying that, that, that those things are necessarily true or false. All I'm saying is that's so simplified that, that a small child can understand it. Mm -hmm. And, um, the problem with a lot of things small children understand is that the world gets more complicated than our child like understanding allows, which I think is part of the reason we're supposed to become like a little child, but also, it's it's a problem because when the world causes you pain and you need an explanation and your view of God is is that um, if you say a quick prayer, all your problems are solved, then they won't be. So I don't I'm not sure um, what the best way to approach really digging into this is. I have a few thoughts, um, but maybe um, you should go first. OK, so. Um, I, the first time I became aware of theodicy, and I don't think the word came up, but I was a student at BYU, and uh, we had... Oh, let's really get a good definition. Okay. Should we ask a dictionary? We should. We sh and, I, and I actually have the um, Wikipedia page open. Perfect. <laughs> I'm pro-Wikipedia. There, I'll let you, uh, you hit it. Theodicy, says Wikipedia, as of this date in December 2018, mm -hmm. in its most common form is an attempt to answer the question of why a good God permits the manifestation of evil, thus resolving the issue of the pro problem of evil. All right, let's just stop there. So if you have a correct theodicy, that means you have a statement of reason that resolves this paradox. That's right. So, um, and of course, the, the paradox is more problematic, like... If God's good, 
I'm good, uh-huh. relatively speaking. Maybe yeah. not as good as God. Uh-huh. I don't want to toot my own <laughs> horn here. But um, certainly bad things happen around me all the time. Um, but I'm not all-powerful or all-knowing, so I get a pass. Uh, but if we want an all-powerful and all-knowing God, then we have this problem. Right. I think it's maybe worth starting with questioning the assumption of... Okay, let's start by accepting the premise, okay? Sure. That you, in order to get theodicy, you cannot have these three things. Okay. All right. I know I don't necessarily agree with that premise. Okay. But let's let's accept the I premise. I think I do, but go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, that's interesting. Let's start with shortening the leg of omnipotence. Okay. All right? It's a Sunday school answer. Can God do anything? Yeah, and... Um... I think the answer is no, because in the Doctrine and Covenants, we know if God does some things, he'll cease to be God. That's right. And so this is a pretty metaphysical question. Is that, but... is that Doctrine and Covenants or, or Book of Mormon? God will cease oh, to be God. Oh, that, that exact phrasing is from the Book of Mormon. It yes. is. Yeah. And it's really interesting because it's, a, it's a, from what I know, it's a particularly Latter-day Saint phrase. I think so. Yeah. And what it's referring to is that God would cease to be God if he didn't do what he said he would do. And was, oh, right. right. So, you know, if you keep the commandments and you will be prospered in the land, right? Right. If you do this, you can't be saved in happen. your sins. Right. Or else God would cease or, to be wait. God. That's the prop. That's the preposition, right? In? Mm-hmm. Okay. So that implies that God could fail and that he just can't, he can't do that. He's not going to, that there are some yeah. things he can't do. He's, he told us already that he can't do that. This so turns into word games really quickly. Okay, well, okay, let's avoid word yeah. games. <laughs> I mean, if God says he, if God can do anything, he can stop himself from doing anything. Right? Like, <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a, this is why you go to the graduate theological uh, union to, uh, to go down these, these wormholes and never come out again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that I think is the easiest way to address the paradox, in my opinion is to just admit the fact that he's put boundaries on himself, mm-hmm. right? He's not going to always interfere because he said he wouldn't, right? Yeah, although that's upsetting uh-huh. if you believe that the only reason God didn't prevent, you know, um, the Black Plague is because he set up these rules. He's like, oh, sorry, guys, I okay. said I couldn't do this. Okay, so um, this is where we get into the other part that I think that I want to talk about that okay. I'm really excited. Um See, I believe that you, if you want to ask, ask the question, why does God allow suffering to happen? You need to be specific. Okay. And you need to break down suffering into, into uh, two categories. Okay? Go on. Man-made. Okay. And random. Sure. That seems fair. Okay. So, I actually think man-made is trivial to explain. Right? If we weren't allowed to have suffering caused one to another, Right? then there wouldn't be any point in us having free will at all. Sure. Right? We have to... Yeah, there's no consequences. There's no free will. We have to... God put us on this earth to... You're sounding very Mormon right now. To be a... Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> We're here to be tested, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it's, a, it's not maybe the most... I don't know how... When something bad happens to you, it's not... It doesn't help. Right. This argument doesn't no. really help. <laughs> it doesn't change the fact that, yeah, that, that you were suffering. <laughs> Somebody hit you in the face. Yeah. But it is, I mean, that's the idea. Um, so before we go down the, the road of randomness, um, what do you think about that? Do you agree? I think, yeah, no, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. Okay. So where did you want to go from here? And then I have a thought. Um, well, gosh, I have so many things I want to talk about. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. I'll come back to my thing. Well, let, for... I don't want people to lose sleep, so I'm going to go back to BYU for a second okay. and what the guy said. And essentially, um, this idea comes from the Keen Follett discourse that, that Joseph Smith gave at Keen Follett's funeral. Mm-hmm. And um, and he resolves the Odyssey this way. Although the the discourse is not about the Odyssey, but, but the stuff that Joseph Smith talks about fits into this space. Um, essentially, the reason the Odyssey is a problem in traditional Christian thought is because God created the universe out of nothing. And if he created out of nothing, then it's exactly what he wanted, made perfectly because he's perfect. We don't believe that. We believe God, that the universe existed in some unformed state, right? And God put it together, but those previously existing things, uh, 
that muddies the water, right? So he's not creating from scratch. He's creating from raw materials. And the same thing with people. Like, we believe that we are co-eternal with God. And intelligences are have been around as long as God, and we became intelligences, whatever that means. And so God didn't create us either. And if God didn't create us, then he can't be blamed if we're not good. But, of course, that's also complicated because we also believe God created us. So mm -hmm. uh, this is tricky stuff. But um, anyway, this person's argument was that because the world is not um, created ex nihilo, that it's not a problem. Ex nihilo. I like that. Yeah. It's just not a problem. Wait, I'm not... Totally sure I'm understanding the argument. So uh, the idea is if uh, if I write a book, say, that came completely out of my mind. Uh, this is a terrible example, and I'm already unhappy with it, but I'm going to finish it. <laughs> um, and whatever's in it is it's purely me, and therefore I'm 100% responsible for everything that's in it, right? Yeah. Um, another argument would be that I am just a built out of the influences that I have, mm -hmm. you know, lived through. I can't, if I want to write a dystopia, I can't do it without being influenced by 1984. That would be impossible. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, because every thought I have is is built on these previous thoughts, nothing is purely mine. Wow. And the same thing, in some ways, true of God. He worked with raw material that already existed, and if it had flaws, then those flaws are in the universe. Oh, that's interesting. So, what your art... Okay. That really does take away the omnipotence of God, right? It does. Right? And, uh, yeah, because, I mean, the, the traditional Christian idea, as I'm defining it, and mm -hmm. traditional Christians are free to disagree with me mm -hmm. in my the way I'm categorizing them, but the idea that God created it, boom, out of nowhere, uh, and it's all 100% him and nothing existed before him, means that God is even more responsible for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. He made us so that we would be evil. That is fascinating. So, of course, okay. Well, that really actually nicely goes into um, where I wanted to go with the difference between man-made suffering and random suffering. Okay. Okay. So. Um, I think I've just conflated them in a way. Mm -hmm. I want to to perhaps reseparate them. <laughs> Feel free. Let's talk about randomness because I find this particular subject really interesting. In grad school, I studied something called DNA replication. Okay. What do you know about DNA? Well, DNA is designed to replicate itself. Uh -huh. But if it were perfect, we wouldn't exist, right? Because evolution never could have happened. That's right. Um, it's changing all the time, DNA. So I want to talk specifically about DNA replication. So okay. every time your one of your cells divides, it has to copy the DNA. Right. Okay, so you, every cell starts 23 with... 23 chromosomes. 23 chromosomes. And I'm going to be using very general numbers. Okay. If you drill down on these numbers, they're not quite right. Okay. That's fine. Let's, I won't be able to call you on it, so... Okay. Let's, <laughs> let's just talk about these general numbers. All right. Okay? We have, bil we have about... Uh, we have billions of base pairs. Billions of base pairs here refers to the letters along the DNA ladder. Okay. All right? It's the, it's the letters in the book of DNA. Okay. Right? And so it has to be copied. Essentially, you could think of copying out a whole book by hand. Sure. And then those copies have to go will go one into each divide of the resultant divided cells. If you make even one mistake, that's a mutation. Right. So as the machinery, and it's machinery, right? It's carbons, nitrogens, oxygens. It's all bound together, and it's a machine mm -hmm. that tracks down the DNA. As it co makes a copy, it can make mistakes, and it can catch those mistakes. And it can back up and fix those mistakes. Yes. Right? So it makes a mistake about one every thousand times it makes a lem it, mm -hmm. it gets a new base pair. And then its own built in proofreading mechanisms adds another one in a thousand. So now we're at like one in a million? One Do I multiply million. those? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Then after the after the after it's been copied, a proofreader comes along behind and looks for even more mistakes. Okay. Right? And that proofreader raises the error rate another one in a thousand. Okay. So that adds up to one in a billion. Okay, and since there's about three billion, you know, per haploid, which is one of the, you know, one half of the, okay, of the uh, pairs yeah. of chromosomes, then um, on average, every time a cell divides, you get one error. Okay. Right. Again, these numbers are rounded. Um, 
which is essentially no errors when you think about statistics. So essentially, yeah, very the, small. essentially the cells get do not make mistakes. Right. However, you have lots of cells. You have cells in your bowel, you have cells in your skin, and the cell, places where your cells are dividing the most are the places where the odds are up against you the most. Sure. You get more and more cell divisions, you get more and more chances of replicating. This process is essentially random. And it is the driving source of evolution right. and cancer. Because every single time <laughs> you can get a... two favorite things. Yeah. <laughs> when, you get a DNA, when you get the wrong mutation, that leads to cancer. So here we have a source of suffering, right? Got it. And it is inherent in our biology. It right. is inherent in the very nature of all of the processes that go with us, Right. How can that, and this, and it causes so much suffering, cancer. It's sure. like the most, one of the most terrible things in the world. How can that be justified, right? How can a random process that leads to so much suffering be justified as coming from a benevolent God, right? How, can, yeah. how, what, per, better stated, what purpose does randomness serve in God's plan? That's a heavy question. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid I might be copying out because I feel like I'm saying the same thing again. Uh -huh. But I do think that part of this is um, by allowing God not to have created everything magically at once mm -hmm. in a literal seven days. You know, by, by assuming that, the pro that science is telling us the truth and the universe is old and it takes time to make an earth and it takes time to build humans out yeah, of, wasn't, you know... It wasn't 6,000 years. Right. Um, which, uh, according to a recent study a majority of latter-day saints now accept evolution hey all right so, yeah so <laughs> but, if, but if if you accept that that's the way creation works uh -huh. then you have to accept that there's randomness and chaos mm -hmm. and that's so, that's how it works so one proposal i think is that the randomness was there when we started right and it's just yeah. part of the universe mm -hmm. and this chips away at the omnipotent leg and well and the omniscient leg Oh, interesting. Because right. chaos, like the nature of random is you can't know. Mm -hmm. That is act that's a good point. That is the very definition. That is actually Schrodinger's law is that you cannot know the superposition of two waves right, right. until you measure them. Right. Mm -hmm. But God has to be above that. Right. I would think so. Yeah. I'm willing to give God plenty more than that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's both the really wonderful thing and the really awful thing about the Odyssey is the only way to talk about this. Well, there are two ways, I think. there's. You can start by assuming that you know, or you can figure it out. Or you can start by assuming that um, God is greater than us, and the world is full of chaos, and we're never going to figure it out. But it's still enjoyable to talk about and and to try to try to grapple with, with big ideas, because yeah. I think that's part of what we're supposed to do. So when I saw this comic strip, I did grapple with it. And I couldn't, I couldn't accept the premise the overall premise that we couldn't have an omniscient, omnivalent, omnivalent. <laughs> it's a hard word to say, but we couldn't do it. I want to talk a bit more about the um, theodicy itself. And, like, what do you have? Well, uh, I was Googling it, mm -hmm. and because I was curious what other traditions said. Mm -hmm. And I ran onto um, a bulletin board run by a bunch of Baptist ministers. Oh, okay. And I don't know how diverse Baptist opinion is. So I don't know if this collection of Baptist ministers is typical or not. I, I don't have a way to know that, but, um, they solve the Odyssey by throwing omni benevolence out. They reject it straight up. They really? say, God is not all good. God has said very clear that he will punish sinners. He's not going to be nice to everybody. Are you crazy? <laughs> Therefore they're suffering in the world because God is not omnibenevolent. Wow, that is interesting. And they considered, and, and the tone of the people in this particular bulletin board is like these people, anybody who thinks otherwise is an idiot. God's not all good. Are you crazy? Have you read the Bible? He's destroying cities all the time. That is, this is, that is not what I expected. No, I was very surprised when I went to a Baptist side. That's not what I was expecting. It's really interesting because I feel like that is an unbreakable leg of that mm -hmm. table, right? Yeah. That whatever argument that you have to get your red ball of theodicy, to get your rational explanation as to the presence of evil, you you will not be left with a non omnibenevolent God. Otherwise, what's the point? I feel I, I think I agree with you. I think that's the most important leg from my from my Latter Day Saint perspective. Yeah. 
Yeah, God loves us. I think that is... Well, I mean, I guess you could argue that God loving you and God being all good aren't the same thing. But I... I, I'm I not don't, sure I could, I, I could argue that. I, and I just... I mean, we were talking before about how you can't be saved in your sins. Uh-huh. But I don't think that's an argument that God isn't all good or all loving. I think this comes back to the omnipotence issue. Like, there are laws of God, and he can't break those. Mm-hmm. If you're a sinner, you have to... You and know. we know that he wants to. Sure. Well, maybe not wants well, to, but, but he's at least sad about it. Yeah. I mean, that's why I love the book of Moses, right? You know, which is, again, one of these mm-hmm. very latter-day states, scriptures, right? The whole... Go, I mean, you know, God wept as he looked down on the world. Yeah. Right? Oh, and I have a Moses scripture that's... Okay. It's, well. it's the epigraph to this essay I was going to bring in. I'll introduce the essay later. Uh-huh. But uh, Moses 8.28 says, The earth was filled with violence. Yeah. That's a natural outcome of creation. Mm-hmm. Violence. It's interesting. I mean, when you talk about evolution as a, as a, as a concept, and evolution is one of my biggest questions. Like, if I died right now and went to go talk to somebody about what really happened, um, I'd have several questions. <laughs> but one would be, you know, about evolution and about, you know, where are the dinosaurs and all that nonsense and stuff. That doesn't matter at all because it's totally consistent. They're but, dead. But, yeah, they're probably, <laughs> probably dead. Yeah. Not, we'll, we'll use the scientific mindset and not assume anything. Yes. <laughs> we saw birds. Yeah, evolution is really interesting. Um, I want to hear more about this uh, essay that you've You've, you've run. All right, so it comes from a book by Stephen L. Peck, who is a writer I highly recommend. Um, subtitle, Wandering of a Mormon Biologist. The book is titled Evolving Faith. Wanderings of a Mormon Biologist. He Evolving is, Faith. He's a he's an evolutionary bio- biologist. He mm-hmm. teaches at Brigham Young. He is um, widely published and highly respected. He's also a terrific writer of fiction hmm. um, and just a good writer generally. And uh, the book is a mix of personal essays and... Um, scientific essays and uh, theological essays as he explores different questions. So mm-hmm. uh, there are, like, I imagine there are some titles here you might like. Randomness, Contingency, and Faith. Is there a science of subjectivity? Okay, yeah, there you go. That's exactly what we were talking about. Yeah, and quite a few about evolution. And um, anyway, it's a it's a great book. I'm almost done with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the most recent essay I read is the one I want to talk about. It's Grace Vis-a-Vis Violence. Mm-hmm. And because it's interesting, before you go there, yeah, please. But earlier, I had said that we could easily resolve um, um, the problem of human caused suffering on each other just by invoking the word agency, sure. right? But that does nothing to resolve the subject of like other forms of violence in the world. God could make sure volcanoes point away from cities. Yeah, or even that animals didn't kill each other, right? Sure. So, um, I'm, and I'm, wouldn't, I'm not suggesting that it's easy to, to, to trivialize violence, humans on humans, but I know we want to go into this essay. When, <laughs> when, I, was in, when I was in college, you yes. know, I didn't get a chance to go too deep on this, but I took a C.S. Lewis class, and he wrote a book called The Problem of Pain. Yes. Which was an amazing book, and I really liked it. And in it, he tries to tackle theodicy. And he does a very good job of it, to be honest. Except when it comes to the topic of violence of animals against other animals. Ah. Yeah. He, you know, I think he just, he missed. He just (laughs) missed. Um, If you disagree, um, I'm sorry, but he really did miss. Uh, there just wasn't a good rationale towards it. So, um, but yeah, I mean, this is part of the whole evolution. Evolution comes from death. You want species, you give them time and death. This is a famous quote. The secrets of the universe are time and death. You will get anything you want, given enough time (laughs) and enough death. Whatever species you could possibly argue, because that's Mm -hmm. how evolution works. Right. Right. All right, anyway, sorry. Okay. That was my diversion. So, uh, Grace Vis-a-Vis Violence by Stephen Peck. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to read the first paragraph, and then I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Uh, Violence permeates existence, he writes. It is structured into the very fabric of the evolved life on Earth through the process of natural selection, a process that seems to have implications for theology, especially our relationship with divine grace. Violence also seems to enter into my life at multiple points, um, unlooked for, mixed with his grace. Yes, mixed with grace. That is what I want to focus on, this inexplicable enfolding of contraries, blessings and cursings, grace and violence. 
And I think that's what our world is. Mm -hmm. um, much of the essay is uh, specific moments that happen to him, um, like when he's a kid and uh, somebody punches him in the face and breaks his nose, um, a car accident he and his wife were in when they were first married, it nearly killed both of them, um, a time that he yelled at his young son and like really, really terrified his son and the regret that follows him because of that. Um, just a number of like awful things that happened to him, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes he was the recipient of violence, sometimes he was the giver of violence. And that's, uh, I'm going to skip ahead several pages to this paragraph. So you see, I've been the victim of violence, and I've participated in violence, both as actor and spectator. And I don't understand it. It puzzles me. Why is it so? Why is it written into the deep fabric of the universe? Mm -hmm. um, oh, and that's I, a great phrase. Why is it written into yeah. the deep fabric of the universe? And uh, the essay is essentially just an extended question. Like, here's, here's the second to last paragraph. Why did the universe, or perhaps at least some aspect of the universe, demand such costs? Uh, here he's referring to, like, the suffering of Christ. Uh, why does it demand its payment in violence, in torture, in a horror of a kind I don't understand? Why is this the price? No wonder grace and mercy lie at the heart of the gospel when violence exacts such a toll and seems to undergird our universe in relentless and unfathomable ways, such mm. that even God suffers. I mean, the the whole... The whole creation of the earth was nothing but unremittent violence. Yes. Right? Where you had asteroids careening down, yes. destroying so much, right? Everything that the that the that the earth, if you could personify the earth, was trying to build up in terms of life and the fulfilling the the crea creation was just destroyed over and over again. And we, when the moon came in and was created you know, through a huge collision. Yeah. I mean, it just set everything over and over again. Written into the fabric. Yes. I I think... I, I love this essay, I think, because it's simply asking a question. And it's a question that he finds upsetting and troubling. But I think sometimes accepting the difficult questions of reality is a path to faith. Mm -hmm. If we had all the answers, then what, where for faith, right? Like, what's the point? So, of course, one of the interesting parts about our faith, right, is that the lion will lay down with the lamb and eat grass. Yeah, uh -huh. we should talk about that sometime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now's as good a time as any. Does this kind of fly in the face of this? Is that eventually, uh, does that phrase mean that violence itself will disappear at some point in the history uh. of uh, humanity? I don't know. Um, my personal theory, and that's why I think this is probably a completely separate episode, um, I'm not convinced that the millennium is real. Like, I think it's a metaphor. This is a, this is a theory I've been working over over the last two years. It's it's vaguely heretic, and yeah, so I feel like it a needs bit heretic. <laughs> yeah, but but I, I feel like I have good spiritual reasons for feeling this way. But yeah. um, I don't. So the, my short answer is like. I don't know if I believe in the literalness of lions and lambs laying down together. Uh -huh. That's that's a question of my theology I've been reconsidering over the last couple of years. That's interesting. I would like to talk about that at some point. Again, not on this episode. Um, because, uh, you know, and I was... One of the pieces of feedback I got, you know, was um, a while ago my brother-in-law... <laughs> Some guy. <laughs> You've Sorry. seen him at various family my, functions. My, my genealogical uh, linkages just yeah. failed me for a second as I try to figure out how to relate people. Um, okay, so my brother-in-law um, asked where we're talking about the millennium, and I told him that I just don't care about the millennium. And he was really surprised, and my sister was there, and she was really surprised, and she wanted to... They didn't understand. I tried to explain... Why I didn't care about it. I care okay. about... This is a great episode. we got to have this episode. Okay, okay, we'll stop. Yeah. That's the cliffhanger. Maybe we um, should do this one next. Something, <laughs> and I suspect that we have similar motivations for arriving in these two places. Mm -hmm. um, okay. One thing that I really wanted to be clear, in the, clear, to be clear about is that um, I don't think any of this conversation about theodicy is necessary to understanding... Um, god as a person right i mean you just you just do the if you just read the scriptures you'll get a good understanding of of who he is and what his intents are however if you think if you use rational if you you do enter these philosophical issues and problems 
and uh, maybe not problem isn't the right words, but conundrums, and it's fun to noodle on them and to try to work them out. I personally don't feel like I need the red ball. All right? Sure. I don't... The, one of the, pre- the real fundamental premise of this comic strip is that we want the ball. That was right in one of the panels. That, we want yeah, it. Faith falls apart if you don't hold the ball in your hands. And I just don't agree. I don't think so either. I think that it's fun to talk about it, but um, some mysteries are mysteries. Our church hates the word mystery. Yeah, I think I, I think I understand why, but I don't agree. I think it's, I think it's okay to be... I love the fact that... Um, I actually think this is one of the great things about our church is that we hate the word mystery. And, <laughs> and I actually... And, but we, we do... And one of the reasons is because we think that we should be able to puzzle it out in our minds. We think right. we should or ask and or receive. ask or, or get a revelation ourselves or, or check or Wikipedia learn, or check Wikipedia, right? <laughs> right. But we we assume that there are we as a, we state as a fact there are some things we don't know. Right. That's okay. That that is that should be the fourteenth article of faith. We believe that we don't know everything. Actually, it is. It right? is. <laughs> yeah, it's not the fourteenth, but yeah, we believe there are many things yet to be revealed. We just and. We're that, chill about it. But or the we whole be. concept of that some things are just unknowable, which I think is what other churches use the word mystery to mean, right? There are some things unknowable that we will never know. This is a concept we just, we don't agree with. Well, and this gets back to why um, when we were talking at the beginning where, where I said the table is a childlike vision of God, mm-hmm. I think I think that feeling you know everything or have to know everything is very childlike and innocent. And I just don't think that that's a healthy adult faith. Yeah, and with that, with that desire to know everything is also an implicit acceptance of what you find out. Right. <laughs> or, or at least a willingness, it's, like, when that stuff shows up to figure out how it fits in. No, what I'm saying is that when you're a child, whatever oh, your oh, parent tells you, right? Yes. Your, your parent, they just hand you the ball. That's why I freaking <laughs> hate Santa Claus. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah. Um, we can put the ball back. I think one really important thing about, I think this gets back into the sort of the, the thesis behind the existence of this podcast is that I really personally reject the concept of overconfidence in faith. Mm -hmm. Like, like whenever someone says that they know the right answer and if I would just accept their answer, everything would be fine. I just, that makes me really uncomfortable because I don't think that's what faith is. Mm -hmm. Um, Faith is faith is grappling with the unknown, and I think it tells us a lot about the nature of God. Also, that um, like the word or not, that there is mystery in our relationship with Him. Mm-hmm. There are things we don't understand, and that's that's cool. It is cool because I frankly I don't want to believe in a God that I can understand right now. I don't think I'm smart enough to understand God. If I if I can understand God completely right now, then He's not that interesting. <laughs> 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 and I appreciate like that. I, I understand what Jesus is. Well, sort of, I understand what he's talking about when he says like, be as a little child. Cause I think that kind of faith is really important. And I think it is the core of any faith, but the question of theodicy, like you were saying, it's just a fun intellectual game until you get cancer. Right. And yeah. then, and then at that moment, I haven't had my cancer moment in my I life. Haven't either. And when that happens, it becomes a little less of a game. Mm-hmm. And, um, all of a sudden, that like really matters, and I it really matters, but I don't know that that changes the probability of finding an answer, mm-hmm. and that's why a faith that is capable of grappling with the unknown and the unknowable and the confusing is vital. I just need a a, con- a construct, something to hang my thoughts on, right? And this was um, this table is where I wanted was the was what I wanted to hang my thoughts on, and you decided to let the table stay pretty. Yeah, at the moment, I'm just going to let it be in a superposition of states. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Spoken like a scientist. <laughs> I did get feedback of people wanting an intro and an outro. Yeah. To which I, to which I say... Nope. (laughs) (laughs) You don't get one.